Amen. Well, now we come to the part of our service where we get to get into the Word of God. Amen. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is your first time coming out. Welcome to the family. Uh, my name is Tyree Ellison. Uh, I get to lead the incredible Southland region with my incredible, lovely wife, JL. Yeah. And uh, I hope you guys are having a good time here this morning. Uh, just excited to worship God. Excited to be alive in a pandemic. There's so much going on right now. There's wars happening across seas. Uh, people still getting sick and COVID. And, uh, but all despite the, all the things that's going on externally, uh, it's just super awesome to be here together as a family, is it not? Yep. You know, uh, I know last uh, worship service we had was our congregational worship service over in Anaheim. And it was incredible to be able to see uh, a lot of uh, our very own in Southland uh, be introduced as shepherds in training. God is doing an incredible thing here in Southland. I mean, even just this yesterday, uh, we got a chance to have our uh, annual Women's Day event, amen? Uh, which was incredible, and it was a blast, it was a treat. And it's kind of like, well, where do we go from here? All this good stuff that's happening, where do we go from here? And I have a message in my heart that I hope inspires you and spur you in. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Say amen when you get there. Amen. Amen. We'll pick it up here at verse 32. And in the Bible it reads, it says, Remember those earlier days, after you received the light, when you were dirt in great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves have better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And but my righteous one will live by faith. I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed. But to those who have faith and are saved. And the church said, Amen. I mean, what an incredible passage of scripture here. Here we see the Hebrew writer. And he's writing a letter to the church. And at this time in the first century, by this time, the church would have been growing and spreading the gospel all over the known land at that time. They would have been growing in their faith, growing in their love for one another. But also, as things were going good, it's interesting how evil is right there at the door. Because he's reminding God's people, hey, do not give up. Opposition is right there. Even though you're trying to do good and overcome this mountain, Satan want to push you back down. I mean, yes, we had an incredible Women's Day event. Because we serve a mighty and powerful God. Amen. But also, this past week was kind of crazy. Right. <laughs> Just being honest, we're family. Let's, let's talk as family, right? Uh, people who tested positive for COVID and some of, our, and, and some, some of those who are, are members here in the church. Uh, let's be praying for them. Uh, some even experienced hardship in their families. You know, some of us have to overcome many things this past week, even myself included. I'm limping for a reason. Yeah. My big toe. Oh, My nail is going on. Not the big toe. Oh, toe. Not the big toe. <laughs> so a lot of us, you know, <laughs> go through pain in life and all these different circumstances. But isn't that not the Christian walk? You know, we're trying to do good, but evil is right there crouching at your door. And like I said, Satan wants to knock you back down. But honestly, I'm so proud of the church and how we responded to that. Right. Not only did we just, you know, try to get knocked down, but we, we got back up. Right. We kept fighting. We stayed offensive. Come on. And we bounced back. Right. I mean, Women's Day was a phenomenal, was it not? Yeah. It was awesome to see over one-for-one -one visitors there. And so that was a victory for the church. Yes. Come on. 
Uh, many of our friends and family got a chance to, to, to see the kingdom of God for some of them for the very first time in their lives. The chat room was filled up with so much encouragement. People were lifting up their, their spouse and all these different things. It was just super awesome. But this is who we need to be. Come on, bro. Not just then, but every single day. But let me remind us, this is truly who we are. The men and women who don't shrink back but the men and women who bounce back. And that's the title of my lesson today. We don't shrink back, we bounce back, amen? Because when you shrink back, you give up, you just stop. But when you bounce back, you respond to the call of adversity. And I only got two points for you guys. The first point is a faith without wavering. A faith without wavering. Let's go to Romans chapter four. And we'll pick it up here in verse 17 in Romans chapter four. And honestly, this was God's, you know, people kind of enduring the same type of situation we see in the 21st century. But what was the re reminder for these people during their time? In Romans 4, pick it up here at verse 17, again, of faith without wavering. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham and hope. I mean, I don't know how that works. Against all hope, Abraham still had hope. He was clinging to something still. And it was God. In verse 18, in hope he believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith. He faced the fact that his body was good as dead since he was a, about a hundred years old. And that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, been fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had I mean, here we see Abraham standing on the promises of God. Kind of like the song for some of us been around for a, for a time. Abraham stood on the promises of God without weakening in his faith. And where does the faith come from? Well, Romans 10, 17 kind of explains it very vividly. It says, faith comes from hearing the message, which is the word of God. And Abraham had this faith in God, but not just that, in God's word. That's why scriptures here, Romans 4, teaches in verse 17, it says what? That we serve a God that calls into beings things that were not. Yeah. Now think about it. In Genesis 1, there was darkness. There was nothing. And God said, hey, let there be light. And what happened? Was there light. was light. In John 11, verse 43, Jesus tells Lazarus to rise from the dead. And what happened? <laughs> Lazarus rose from the dead. Literally serve a God all throughout the Bible from the Old Testament as well to the New. They was calling things into being that was never there Why? Because we serve a powerful God. And God's word is powerful as well. As it says in John 1, it even makes reference of this. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was what? God's word is powerful. But do you believe that? Thank you, bro. I appreciate it. Let's give it up for Zechariah, guys. <laughs> Don't say Zechariah, it's Zechariah, okay? <laughs> To let you know, I know for my spirit. Amen. But if you go back to the text, look at verse 18. It says, Against all hope, Abraham and hope. How does that happen? Opposition, I mean, against all hope. It's 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 like it's, it's, it's way down on him, but he had a hope still. Why? Because Abraham had an unmovable hope that was in what? God and God's word. Verse 19, it says, without weakening in his face, he didn't get down. He didn't get discouraged. His faith didn't get weaker. It says without weakening in his faith. Why? Because his faith was deeply anchored in what? God and God's word. Wow. In verse 20, it says, Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith. They didn't waver. He didn't get discouraged. He didn't get down. He didn't pout. He didn't become faithless. And what does this word unwavering mean? Well, it means to have a steadiness and a resoluteness. Mm. Meaning what? Abraham had an unwavering faith that was steady 
that and then like was it all over the place? Like you kind of see like the car dealerships and that little the little uh, blow, little dudes <laughs> moving around. It wasn't like it wasn't like that. It wasn't all over the place. It was steady. It was resolute. Wow. Why? Because he was focused on God and God's word. Come on. And here's the thing: despite all that was happening around him, in this passage we learn that an unwavering faith teaches us a couple of things. Let's kind of dive into it. Look at verse 21. It says, "Being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what He had promised, that it allows, like, an unwavering faith allows you one to be fully persuaded by the power of God." Mm. That's what the Bible says. And so, if your faith is steady, guess what? You're fully persuaded. You're convinced. You don't need no miracle just to, for you to believe. You, you already believe because you understand the power of God. Wow. And, and two, we can learn from this. Those who have an unwavering faith, it helps you get stronger. Yeah. As it says in verse 20, he was strengthened in his faith. And so, if your faith is un, unwavering and it's, and it's resolute, guess what? You should be getting stronger in your faith. And Abraham, we noticed to be the case because he was fully persuaded by God and the power of God and understanding that God can do what he had promised. God never changed, right? He's the same God. That's the same God that Abraham believed in. Well, one may ask, well, what did God's word tell Abraham? Right? Like, told him something, obviously. <laughs> And what was this promise? He promised them something. And, and a lot of us want some promises from God, don't we not? Amen. Let's go over to Genesis chapter 12. Come on, bro. Genesis 12. Let's just see what God had told Abraham. What was this promise? Look at verse 1. It says, The Lord has said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. It's kind of cool, God. I got your back right there, right? right? In verse 3, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Through you. Through Randall. Through NIE. Through Zechariah. Through Charlotte. Through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old. When he set out from Haran, he took his wife, amen, to the Marys, amen. He took his <laughs> wife along with him. Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. So we see from the passage of scripture, Abram is 75 years old. And, and it's kind of ironic here in a sense where like he wasn't called by God at 15. Maybe when he was like very mobile or whatever, right? Um, he wasn't called by God maybe in his 20s and 30s. For some of us, we can, in our 20s and 30s, we're a little bit more, more mobile as well because we're still trying to get acclimated into our career. So we, we can just kind of take up and go somewhere if we want to, right? But no, he calls Abram at 75 years old. Wow. When his life was probably at this point already kind of like settled in. And maybe he's probably set in his ways a little bit as well. And we got to understand from the scriptures that, remember, at some point he becomes Abraham, and we'll get into that. But before even that, he was Abram. Right. We understand this because God wanted to do something greater in his life. But it also teaches us a great principle. That we're never outdated to be called by God. Amen. Amen let's go. That God gives Abram this promise in Genesis 12. And some of you guys who are familiar with the story of Abram who becomes Abraham. But we know by the time as you fast forward to Genesis 21, he has a son. And his son is named Isaac. And as time goes on, you do the calculation, it's 25 years have went by. Think about that for a second. He's 75. And on top of that, 25 more years go by. Wow. So now Abraham wasn't, as Romans 4 kind of like alluded to, put the scriptures in context, let like the Bible reconcile the Bible. During this time, he still was without weakening in his faith. Ain't that crazy? He was out. This guy had an unwavering faith still. Despite all the hardships, 
physically, mentally, mobily, maybe financially, I don't know. Despite whatever it may be, whatever the odds was, he was faithful in those 25 long years. Yeah. And obviously, some of you guys may know the story of Abraham. What happened during those 25 long years? Well, here's the thing. He got tested. Yeah. His faith got tested. He was in a famine. The external things that he don't have no control over, kind of like for some of us in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. You can't control it. It's just, we got to learn to embrace it. It just is right now. Yeah, right, right. And Abraham, in the same situation, was tested through external things in his life. I mean, think about it. He almost lost his life in his life to Pharaoh. To the point where he's like, you know, that's my sister. It wasn't probably like a good call. He kind of made some mistakes along the way, yeah, right? <laughs> Maybe some of the married brothers can relate. I know I can. Uh, <laughs> Here's the thing. During this time period, he's seen two cities destroyed. That's true. Yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. Think about that. Two cities with people who probably, I mean, in the course of the scriptures, not everybody was righteous. Mm -hmm. okay. Right? But just think about that for a second. I mean, we're in the Southland area. Just think about maybe if Pasadena was just taken up. Mm. The IE. A lot of us got family in IE. This is a big county. Mm -hmm. Imagine that though. Sure do. Like, in this lifetime, he's seen two cities destroyed. And not just that, even his nephew's, li uh, nephew's li wife got destroyed yeah. with it as well because she looked back, kind of like symbolic of like, turning back to a life of sin. Yep. And she turns yeah. into a pillar of salt. And she didn't make it either. So not only that, like, two cities destroyed, and his heart is went out for the people, because you see the condition of it, right. and some of his family members are impacted by this as well. And not just that, his wife, Sarah, was struggling to, 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 to give birth. Mm -hmm. And for some women, for, you know, like, I'm speaking from a guy's perspective, I don't know anything, so don't, you know. Hey, but, come on, bro. but for some women during this time period, like, that was everything. And for some, even today, that could be, for some, everything, mm -hmm. right? But year one, he didn't get down. Year two, he didn't get down. Year three, and so forth, he didn't get down. He waited 25 long years. Mm -hmm. 25 long years. And this guy did not waver in his faith. But we got to think from the, from the, for a second through this scripture, it wasn't like God wasn't still working. Right. right. God was working. Yeah. And it was during these times, and these sometimes even times of hardship, mm -hmm. God was working to help Abram, changing his character so he could go from Abram to becoming Abraham. Right. On. On, and then it's during these times that he would just be just a, 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 a guy that's have maybe an impact on his family, but no, he'd be a guy that God destined to have an impact on many nations. You know, like Abraham. For us in this room, we got to allow our circumstances to dictate our convictions, especially our viewpoint of who God is from the scriptures. Or we can make a decision to allow our convictions to dictate our circumstances. Amen. Come on, bro. You know, those who display that type of faith is, the Bible says, they have a faith without weakening. You follow? Yeah, come on. But some of us, you know, we can allow those circumstances to dictate our faith. I've been one of them on that internet at times, right? And we, sometimes we can believe, bring that type of, if you will, garbage into the kingdom. Come on, bro. And we come into the kingdom with just missed expectations. Like, well, I want the promises of God, too. What God can do for me? <laughs> you know, we want 100% of what God can do for me, but we can't even give God 10%. Come on. Ooh. Come on. Come on. Come on. And we have this whole American mindset of what God is like. He's like a genie. He's just supposed to be like... Throwing blessings out there. No, that's not the God of the Bible. Come on, babe. This guy was in hardship. Right. Come on. This guy was in hardship. Mm -hmm. Maybe God just wants you in hardship. <laughs> and that's it. That brings him glory. Amen. Right. Would you still be faithful? Mm -hmm. Some of us can have the expectation, like, well, I'm in the kingdom. Hey, where's my girlfriend? Where's, where's my boyfriend at? Mm. You know? I, I, want, I want to say yes to the dress, too. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> they have this mindset like, oh, okay when are people going to lift me up right. and some can even feel entitled for especially some of us who've been around for a while like well I've been in the kingdom 5 years I've been in the kingdom 10 years, 20 years 25 long years like Abraham right mm -hmm. and we can forget to keep our eyes and our hope on God and his word right. and we can quickly 
lose sight of that. Our priorities kind of start to get jaded. Just been around for some time, like, you know, just like the Jewish men and women. <laughs> They're father of Abraham, you know, we, we have every right. That's not the Bible. You know, we gotta make sure our, our motives is always in the right spiritual place, amen. Amen. Come on, bro. But however, if, if this is our heart, the cool thing about I love about the Bible, and this is not to shame anyone, but the cool thing I love about the Bible is that you can change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Right. We forget that sometimes, like, this is how I know you can change from the Bible, guess what? You're here. Yeah, true. <laughs> this is how I know you can change. You guys are here. But let's look at a biblical perspective. Let's go to Romans 4. Let's go back there. Come on, bro. Let's look at the Bible's perspective. Because the cool thing, and thank God to, for his word and discipling and people in our lives that help us see the flaws that we can't see. Because we can change. Look at Romans chapter 4. Just a little bit, a couple of verses after what we just read. Look at verse 23. In the Bible, it reads, it says, The words that was credited to him, meaning to Abraham, were written not for him alone, but also for us. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Let's read it again. The words that was credited to him, meaning Abraham, were written not for him alone, meaning Abraham. It wasn't just for him, but also for us. Meaning what? That the same hope to have a belief of who God is from the Bible, <laughs> that's important, and who God say he is from his word, it wasn't just meant for Abraham, but guess what? It's meant for every single one of you here this morning. Wow. Yeah. That just like Abraham can make a difference in his day and age, that we too can make a difference in our day and age. Are you with me, church? Yeah. Yeah. But all it takes is a decision. What decision are you going to make here this morning? Are you going to just kind of ride on the culture of other people's faith? Or you're going to ride on the faith of who God called you to be by relying on his word. I believe we are these people without a weakening in our faith. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here, honestly. Right. But I think we could, we, could, we could take it to another level. Come on, bro. Because God doesn't just want to keep us where we're at just to be the Abrams or Sarah's. He wants to be us to, to be the Abrahams and Sarah's, yeah. the father of many nations as well as the mother of many nations. A faith without weakening that God can work through us to help others. A faith without weakening, no matter what your circumstances you're currently in, that you can still stay righteous in it. Yeah. A faith without weakening where our hope is in God and God's word. As we stand on the promises of God, being fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he has promised. And we are those who trust in God's word for our lives, but also we are those who call things that are not as though as they are. We are those who preach faith into dry bones. Are you with me? Yeah. This is who we are. Yeah. This is our family story. Like, honestly, I'm not just trying to sell you a power thought. I'm not here, that's not, I'm not here to just make you feel good. Come I'm on, here bro. to make you feel God. Amen. Oh, Amen. come on, Tari. You know, as a, as a family of churches, we're, we're a movement. We're not just here, just meeting here. We're a movement of churches. It's the kingdom. We're just doing our best to try to really put the Bible into application in our lives. But for a lot of us, we got to think like, well, how did our church even get here? It started out as a mission team. Mm -hmm. For a lot of my churches all around the movement, it started out as a mission team. You know, and I, with that in mind, I just want to lift up my incredible wife, Jay. Come on. And she may have alluded to this uh, yesterday. She's like, oh my goodness. <laughs> but, uh, you know, back in 2009, my wife uh, got baptized in our sister church in Chicago. Yeah. In our hometown of Illinois uh, as a campus student. But come uh, 2012, she caught the dream of wanting to go into ministry uh, for a time. And to give up everything, uh, her, her whole life and her whole lifestyle, to leave her family um, in Illinois to, to uproot ourselves to plant the church in San Francisco in 2012. And she had the opportunity to do so with uh, Mikey and Brittany Underhill, who now leads in Hawaii, amen? Yeah. And I uh, believe at the time, they were a mission team of like just 35 to 40 disciples. And they all started out in John and Laura Zamora's uh, living room in their home. They're uh, shepherds in San Francisco. Um, they're an awesome couple. But just think about that. This 35, 40 to people just in, in this tight space in the living room. Yep. <laughs> like just, just squish that sardines, just try to make it work. Like we're here to preach the word, you know. Like well, God is with us, you know. Yeah. Like, it, it, in Silicon Valley, it's just around that, it's millions of people against thirty-five to forty. It's right. kind of bad odds, it seems like, right? But we serve a God who loves bad odds. Yeah. 
Eventually, the Underhills get a place closer to campus, and uh, they ended up bringing some disciples along with them, and J.L. was one of them. Amen. And the catch was this. Since the landlord, you know, wouldn't allow people who weren't on the lease to sublet, you know what I mean? Like, uh, the sisters had no choice but to only um, be out the house between 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. So they couldn't come home anytime during the day. <laughs> it was just like, <laughs> you're out there. Because if you come home, you could kind of, you know what I mean? You don't want to get on bad terms with the landlord there. And so every day what the sisters would do, they would get up super early, get dressed, and leave the house by 8 a.m. Wow. And, and if some sisters didn't have a job, well, guess what? Their job was getting a job. Right, <laughs> right, right. You don't got no job, you better get a job. That's your job. <laughs> Until you follow them, amen? But here's the thing. If, they needed, if the sisters needed a, a sister's household or the brothers needed a brother's household, where well, their full-time job was what? Going to find a household. And they did this for some time, and it just it was really inspiring because they had a no limits mentality. Come on. They had a whatever it took mentality because they understood that they were called by God to go into that city to bring light to a dark place. Yeah. They were a mission team on a mission. And JL would, you know, do her quiet times at the malls with the sisters. And then go to work at the mall. I believe she was the only one at the time probably with a with a job. But however, after work, she can't go home. <laughs> So what would she do? She would share her faith up until 9 p.m. When she uh, and the sisters would come back, they would just keep doing it over and over and over. And then eventually the sisters get a household and they uh, move to Berkeley, which is, uh, you know, just a suburb outside of San Francisco for some of us who may not be familiar with the Bay Area. And the sisters, uh, now they're living further away from San Francisco, but mind you, all of the services were in San Francisco. And so on Sunday mornings, what had to happen? They, 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 they there, they're called by God, and they're disciples, so they seek the kingdom first, right? And so the sisters will have to get up at 5 a.m. Wow. Come on. To catch three buses. Not one, not two, but three. Wow. Three. Right. 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 Just to get the Sunday service, to get the song practice on time. Okay. Wow. And for some of us, we know what time song practice starts. It starts pretty early. Yeah. <laughs> right? And so they will have to get up at 5 a.m., catch three buses to get there on time to be able to worship God. Amen. And then eventually this foundation is set, the church grows and it grows. But I'm just so proud of my wife because JL, you know, she she keep she kept working hard. She prayed fervently, trusting in the process as well. Sometimes God is just trying to take you through different things. And it may not be the way you want it to look. Right. But that doesn't mean God is still not working. Sometimes you gotta trust that process still. Yeah. You know, JL's been a nanny. She drove Uber, got in a ton of debt. I would know because we're married and we're one. Amen. <laughs> but not just that. She took on my debt as well. Amen. <laughs> I love you, girl. Uh, she cleaned homes. Uh, she was a barista, uh, having to get up super early, even, even, even pregnant at times. Right? But she had to do whatever she had to do. She, she did whatever was asked of her with a cheerful and, and grateful heart. Amen. And not to mention some of these past years as well, um, in her health, she was limited at times. You know, um, her feet keep swelling at one point of her uh, stage in her life, just where her health is really low uh, due to sleep apnea. She's constantly keep going in and out of the uh, hospital. And that's not to mention all the external things that would happen in her family from uh, far away with the, with the passing of uh, loved ones and things like that as well. But I'm just so proud of my wife and how she responded. Yeah, and how she just it. didn't give up or didn't get down, but just kept getting better and better. Amen. And, better. Amen. Come on. and now, 13 years later, JL is now full time in the ministry as a point of women's ministry leader, a region leader, a mother, and married to some guy named Tyree. Oh, oh, oh. oh snap. And yesterday, she got to do a phenomenal job yeah. at the women's ministry. Yeah. Yeah. But here's the thing. I think some of us can look at JL and so like, man, that's JL though. Right. But to be honest, it's a lot of our stories. We all been through a lot of different things. But the reality is, how do we respond to it? Or do we respond to it with just like Abraham and just, you know what, I'm gonna have an unwavering faith. I'm gonna trust the process where God is trying to take me. Yeah. And you think about it, you know, the Bible is filled with many stories just like that. Men and women going through so many challenges. <laughs> obstacles in life but yet had an unwavering faith because they understood who God was and they put their hope in God and God's word and they overcame and we talk about these people we look up to these people the Peters the Pauls right. 
Right. And if they, if they didn't overcome anything, what would you read and what would you talk about? Right. Right. Nothing. Good point. Good point. And for some of us, we got to look at that even in our own personal lives. If you don't go through anything, what would you talk about? What would you preach about? How would you be able to relate to people? People don't want a, a, a sugar-coated Christianity. They want the true and authentic Christianity. Come on. But that's the, that's the Christianity of the Bible. These guys went through it. But look how they're responsible to us. You know, I want to challenge you guys this uh, morning. With three challenges, actually. Okay. Yeah, okay. Challenges, bro. One, make a decision to not be discouraged. Mm. Come on, bro. All right. I like that one. It's actually not righteous. Jesus wasn't discouraged. Actually, in the Psalms, we love reading the Psalms. It, it talks about, I believe, it says, God hates faithless people. Yeah. Because what you're doing is not like me trying to attack anyone. It's literally like you're calling God a liar and you're going against God, who God is calling you to be. Two, make a decision to never underestimate the power of God and what God can do in your life. God can do so much more if you allow him. On, if you make a decision to follow him. And number three, make a decision to imitate the faith of Abraham, who was without weakness in his faith because he decided to put his hope in the right things. Amen. God and God's word. Are you with me? Amen. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. My second point, remember the life you were called to. Ephesians chapter four. Come on, bro. Coming around the bend. Ephesians chapter four. Remember the life you were called to. Ephesians chapter four. We pick it up here in verse one. And it says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Drop down to verse 17. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. Yeah. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him, in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitudes of your minds, and to put on a new self. Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Here Paul is teaching and he's talking to the church in Ephesus. To live a life worthy of the calling that they received when they made Jesus Lord of their lives. And what's a life worth me living? It, it means to, to, to live a life that's meaningful and purposeful. And it's reminding the people who may have forgotten at this time. He's like, dude. In Christ, you, you, you actually get to do that. You get to live a purposeful life that's meaningful. And not just that, you're making a difference across the world. Come on. Come on, Cyrus. You actually can change people's lives with the Bible. Come on, bro. And for some of them, they have forgotten. Even for some of us in this room, can be in the same shoes. Yeah. And it reminds them, hey, look, just put off your old self. And be made new in the attitudes of your mind. Like metanoia in the Greek is a change of my mind. He was talking about repentance. Just change your way of thinking. Throw off your old self. It's not about you. It's about God. Right. And why was Paul reminding him about this? Because some began to live their old lives again. Yeah. Their old lives began to creep, creep in again. You know, even for some of us this morning... You got to ask yourself, is parts of my old life starting to creep back into my life now? Come on, bro. Is parts of my old life starting to creep back into my life, even in the church? That's what he's writing his letter to. Christians. Hello. I'm on time. And so Paul is teaching them to how to conduct themselves as Christians, as, as being a new creation in Christ. And how to also just, man, mature spiritually and grow and also how to deal with disputes within the church. Because guess what? In the church, we're going to sit against each other. But sometimes when we sit against each other, we're like, you just throw people off and just shaming people and just cutting people off. It's, we can't be like the world in that. Amen? We got to be family. And family bleed for unity. Amen. If you don't believe me, guess what? It happened all throughout the Bible. God left his people during the days of Moses. God left his people at this point, at one point as well. The yeah. kingdom is, is many times in the Bible, God left his people. 
God left his people in his own form of fellowship. God can lead his people now yeah. if we're not careful. But here's the thing. What was this church known for before it got to this point? Look at chapter one. Come on, bro. Oh, sorry. I hope you guys still fired up. Do a little Bible study. Come on, bro. Ephesians chapter one, look at verse 15 real quick. It says, for this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Paul was blown away by this church in Ephesus. He was blown away by their, their amazing faith for God and God's people, but, but their love for God and God's people as well. Here's the thing. God, uh, Paul heard about this. I Meaning their, their lives were evident. It was, it was known when people came in, they felt it in a room. Yeah. It was something that was in effect. It was so real because they were so close and devoted to God. Amen. And it permeated throughout the rest of the church and, and people just blown away. And Paul in his prayers like, man, that church is amazing. The love they have for God, the, 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 the faith they had was known everywhere. And people will look at this church and be amazed how close they were. They will look at this church like, man, this church is truly the kingdom of God. Right. This church is truly family. Come on. Despite the differences, despite the odds, they were family. But it made me think also, well, how did this awesome, cranking, fired up church become the church we see in Revelation chapter 2? Let's go there. Ooh. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Revelation chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. It says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but have not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. I mean, like, what? what just happened here? Mm. How did this cranky church in Ephesus that, that it was known for their faith and their love for each other that permeated throughout the known world at that time become the church we see here? Sadly, in the midst of all it is good, in the midst of everything that was going on in their lives, they forgot about God. It was a church that began to focus more now on men rather than keeping their focus and their eyes fixated on God. And here's the thing. They did good things. Ain't that scary? They did good things in the church. This is, hey, they can tolerate sin. Like, that's awesome. I don't want to tolerate no sin. I don't know about you. Sin destroy families, destroy our lives, destroy my life. I don't want to tolerate that. Right. And so if some of you guys think other differently, well, just look at your family. Yeah. How's that working for them? Wow. Come on, bro. It's not going to be any, my life. Is, no, it's not. Right. Our lives are no different. And so these guys were doing good and they tolerate sin. And here's the thing. They endured hardship. But sadly, even amongst all of that, they lost God. In it. Yeah. Right. And it shows you that you can still go through the motions and do good things and still actually not be close to God. Come on. Wow. You could come to church and look apart and Maybe act like you're singing the songs, but really we know you're not really giving your heart and still not be close to God. You can come to the meetings of the body and be there and be in the D time and be physically present, right. but spiritually not be present. Come on, be checked bro. out still. Right. Okay. There's a, another thing. Even sometimes well, God would even allow you to have success. Come on. Yeah, you can baptize, it. you can make disciples, that's you can do it. all these different things. Like, hey, we're cranking over here, bro. We're, we're growing our ministry. And rely on your own skills and talents that was given from God to you mm. so you can have the skill sets to do what you do and lose God in it all. Wow. 
You can baptize all day long and still end up in Revelations 2. Come on. Wow. That's crazy. And what happened? It, it, what was the problem? It was just a heart condition. They forsaken their first love, which was God. What does forsaken mean? It means to abandon. Right. You abandon God. And maybe for some of you didn't abandon God physically. Maybe you hear amen, but maybe sometimes we can abandon God emotionally. Yeah, maybe we can abandon God mentally. We can yeah. check out. Maybe we can abandon God spiritually. Come on, bro. And you can't fake this. You can't camouflage true Christianity. Come on. Right. We know who you are. <laughs> and you know who Come you on. are. Come on. Reach, bro. The people begin to revert backwards oh. in their love. Think about that. They were just known for their love, and they start to push their heart back. Yeah. Because they were hurt. Because of the sin. Yeah, because of external hardship. All these damages of different things. It is, it's always a story. Mm -hmm. But God is not, he's not concerned about all of that. He's like, what's going to be your response? Yeah, come on. Are you going to be faithful through it? Come on. Will you still love me through it? Come on. Honestly, I think this is why Jesus, when he went to the cross, he cried. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a part of the story where we do the cross study. It's something that always makes me emotional. Because even Jesus himself, through all the damage he went through, the beating, the hurt, the pain, and he didn't deserve it. If anybody was like pure in it all, it was him. Right. He was sinless. But yet he, he cried because he knew that when he went on that cross, he would take on the sin of the world. And at that time, he would be forsaken by his body. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see a lot of people from the form of fellowship crying. In tears because they understand what that feels like. On, they understand what life is not like without the kingdom. They understand what it's like without disciples. They understand what people don't care. Yeah. And some of us in this room, we take that for granted. Come on, as if God owes you anything. He doesn't owe you anything. On, you owe him your life. Yes. Yeah. Come on, Tyree. Okay. And it always makes me emotional because I never was part of the former fellowship. But I know what it felt like. When my life was in the darkness, I know what it feel like not having God and forsaken. And I think some of us, we gotta have a reality check. You gotta gotta like really sit in there and just see where you at with God and see how far have you fallen. And the challenge is for you today to repent and turn to your first love. Are you with me? You know, I want to challenge you guys to return to your first love. We all fall short of the glory of God. No one's perfect. I, I'm preaching to myself here. It's times this past week, I, I want to just numb out and, and just be all emotional because of my pain in my foot. It affected my quiet times. It affected my prayer life a little bit this, this, this morning. But I, I think God has us where he wants us for a reason. Maybe it's to teach you how not to give up. Maybe it's to teach you how to fight for your relationship with God. Because if it's easy, it's easy. It's easy in, easy out. But God sometimes just want to teach you, like, hey, maybe, do you still love me? Hey, work for it. And I think that's what God was really teaching me this past week. Like, okay, I, it's hard to pray because I, the, the pain, yeah, amen, is there. Romans 8, 28, for all, for all, God is like, you know, all things, he's working for your good. Hebrews 12, God disciplined those he loves. So God has me where he wants me. But if I didn't make the decision to keep fighting and to keep trying to pray, man, who knows where I would have been. And some of you guys are in the same boat because we're family and we're in the same ministry. But I want to call you guys. If you feel like you feel short, whether you are visiting, we all fall short in different areas to repent and turn to your first love. Amen. 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 You know, as we conclude, let's make a decision to have a faith without weakening like Abraham so we can be the men and women that God so desires for us to be. Not just for ourselves. Salvation is not just for us, but it's for us to bring to other people. It's a selfless attitude, just like Jesus died on the cross. Let's die to ourselves so we can be the men and women that God desires for us to be. So we can save many lives in Southland, in L.A., and around the world. And number two, let's go after remembering the life that God called us to by returning to our first love. Let's be those who don't shrink back, but bounce back. I love you, family. Thank you.